welcome to this week's episode of the Vulnerability Rocks podcast. And I am really pleased to introduce you to Marcus. Now, Marcus, I first became aware of you um, when you were doing this insane mission of 30 <laughs> marathons in 30 days. Now, I'd been, <laughs> I'd been like pretty much in Dubai full time for about a year because um, mm. I first came in October 17 and I think it was in the October November 19 wasn't it and yeah, yeah and, 18 yeah, yeah yeah 18 yeah sorry I came in 17 and 18 that's it and I remember like hearing about this 30 over 30 in Dubai you know where they encourage fitness 30 minutes of fitness every day for 30 days and I was thinking that's super cool super yeah. manageable <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw this complete lunatic running a marathon every day for 30 days and I was like well this has taken it to a whole new level <laughs> and in and I say lunatic in the nicest possible way because it was incredibly oh, it. inspiring I, it. I was like wow with capital W you know this guy has smashed this 30 30 completely out of the water yeah. um and I kept watching you every day and watching oh, no people way. join you and <laughs> watching you know kids come and join you for the last leg of the yeah. run on a day yeah. And it was just incredible. There was like people oh, you didn't you. even know just turning up, yeah. running next to you. And you were like, I remember watching you going, I don't know who these people are. They've all just turned up and they're all just running the last <laughs> yeah. bit of me. I was like, oh my God, this is insane. It was crazy, mate. Yeah, it really what was. a wonderful thing though. And you brought people out from everywhere who just started yeah. running with you to support yeah. you, to stand next to you while you yeah. were doing something so grueling. And wow <laughs> yeah, thank you no it's um yeah it was crazy it was really crazy Emma and and I still think back on it like even sat here listening to you say that now like it just brings this incredible emotion because it was like that and I I actually missed a lot of the moments which sounds a bit weird but you know like suddenly there'd be someone else running with me and but then I'd hear like the next day that they'd skipped work, they'd got a speeding fine to get there, they'd illegally parked their car, and actually they'd been running with me for about half an hour, and then they'd just come to say hi before they left. And I'm like, I felt so bad because I'm like, oh my God, these people have gone to. So it was just a, it was a crazy time. It was, it was unreal. I, I didn't know how you were gonna introduce me, but that was quite good and, and you made me <laughs> laugh. So I appreciate that. <laughs> It's, well, the thing is, I had to introduce you how I was introduced to you, right? And right. that was my experience of meeting Marcus on uh, online amazing. through your social media. And what I amazing. saw was something beautiful. I saw, um, like, for me, I'm a big believer in bringing people together because I believe that if you bring people yeah. together, we can achieve more, especially in the healing and kind of dealing Absolutely. with big stuff. Yeah. So and you did this this thing and this you actually got people coming yeah. from all over the place and mm. just randomly running next to you and turning up for the last legs of something to like mm. help carry you through to the end of something and I just yeah. it was just wonderful it was the most beautiful thing to watch honestly yeah it's cool and, and I appreciate what you picked up on there because it really did like it really did carry me through those last bits and, and people turning up randomly and it didn't matter if they ran with me for five minutes or I had one guy that basically of the 30 days I think he came and ran 20 of the days which it's just, and it just shows as well, I mean, we, we, we are, and we are talking before we started recording, we're, we're an incredible time for humanity, but there is so many good people around. And mm. there's two different things going on as well. When you create something that people can belong to and can show their humanity towards, we see quite epic things happening. And, and my background's in team sport. And I think one of my biggest fears as I was going through that is there's gonna come a point where this is going to end you know i'm not going to have all my rugby mates around me anymore and mm -hmm. i always thought sort of through my 20s i was like how can we continue this and and how important this community this support network call it what you want and you know some people say support networks like two or three people that's cool as well community mm -hmm. could be hundreds of people cults whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. and I, I always was thinking like how can how can i make sure that 
I'm always part of something that supports me like rugby has. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I started my business because I just wanted people to train with. I didn't actually, I didn't set out to create in a fight and all this. I just wanted a few mates I could train with because I knew, it's just funny when we talk about it. I love like it. That, it's right? like I just wanted some mates to train with. And, uh... yeah, isn't it? and it just kind of goes boom. And I know, you're, yeah. You're just like, wow. But mm -hmm. it just shows. And, and, and I think now is a time there's no better time than right now to sort of look at humanity and, and look as humans, how we behave and what mm -hmm. really makes us happy. And that sense of belonging is something that that's huge. And, and to, to then be able to flip it. And this is the second thing to actually have that impact on, on, especially you mentioned there, those kids lives and oh. this will make you laugh as well. I, mean, I, I would be going and it still happens a little bit now, not as often, but I go to Spinney's and a kids would see me at the end of the, uh, the aisle and they'd be like, <laughs> Marathon man! Oh, oh no! This is <laughs> Marathon man. Well, I mean, you earned it. And you earned it. Well, right? You, <laughs> yeah. you, I think you can definitely claim that title forever. You exactly. know? <laughs> yeah. But then their parents would come up to me and they say, "Oh, it's so nice to see you." Just my kid never liked running, and just because you ran at their school that day, they now mm. love running, and I'm so happy for them. And I'm like, "Wow, that's like." You know, and it, it, it makes me quite emotional, but it, it drives me incredibly as well. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a mental 30 days, mate. It really oh, was. I'm just, well, I just, wow, wow. I don't know how you did it. I'm glad you did it for you <laughs> and you. for so many people that you clearly inspired. And, mm. you know, you could, like, it, it's not that what you did would have now made everybody a marathon runner. It was more than mm. that. It was bringing people together and people wanted to, even if they weren't runners, they wanted to just come and like hold you through parts of your journey. And yeah. so it was just, it was just a wonderful thing to watch. And I was just watching it and saying, oh, wow. You. And you were, and then they were like, you know, and I'm here and like, look at all these people. And I was like, oh my God, like this, what is this? Yeah. And then the absolute finale was you appearing on the side of the Burj Khalifa. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, and I said to my husband, I was like, this guy is off the charts i said look what he's done yeah. and it was just incredible um, it's funny that one because as well the i think it was the day before i got to run with his highness sheikh hamdan and it's quite amusing sometimes when 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 i'm speaking to companies and i do a lot of big sort of talk motivational talks call it what you will and i put up that slide one with sort of sheikh hamdan and one with the burj khalifa and you can see like the marketing people are going, oh my God, how? You know, <laughs> like these two insane PR opportunities and 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 our brands there. And it's yeah. just like, you can see their minds racing. And it's like, well, I didn't pay money for that stuff, but I paid in a different oh, way. Yeah. I, guess, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was watching some of your videos of the recovery parts afterwards you know and, yeah. and, and i mean it it was it was brutal right like yeah it's hard yeah, yeah i mean i don't i can't say i even know a nth degree of it i don't but i just i could see that it was brutal as well yeah. that what you put yourself <laughs> through to achieve that but mm. also i want to come on to something else because um you just briefly mentioned it that you you know rugby was a massive part of your world and you're a professional rugby player right yeah and yeah. that you came out of when when did you finish that uh really in about 2004 yeah mm. yeah so it's been a while now <laughs> and then you kind of took up this pursuit of completing extreme challenges yes so tell me about a few of them because some of yeah. them uh, you know are equally as <laughs> remarkable <laughs> yeah well I, I think to give it some context of, of where it really started I, I, I finished playing sort of full-time in 2004 and then in two, end of 2009 I, I retired completely from rugby and I, I was just about I just turned 30 and because I'd created this training group of, of, of people and good people we need good people around us. And, 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 you know, the All Blacks legacy book by James Kerr, I think is very relevant here. And excuse my French, but no dickheads rule has always really resonated with me. So mm -hmm. we had good people around us. And what that did is it, it brought people to me to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady that came to me and she told me about this ultra marathon she was going to run. And literally she's telling me, I'm at, and I'm just going, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, I just, I, I was, I mean, you, you know me a little bit. I'm not often lost for words, but I was just lost for words. I was like, you know, I don't know. And I often feel quite guilty. I'm like, is it my sort of this awful masculine side that's like, oh, how's this female going to do this? Or, or you know, and, and I, I have to be open about that. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was because she was a female, she was a middle-aged female or, or what it was. Anyway, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I turned around to her and I think this is quite important and, and it sort of plays in with, with the title of your show, Vulnerability Rocks, is that I was like, I don't know anything about these races. Mm -hmm. I said, I know a lot of things. I know how to get, I know how to work on your nutrition, your strength, mindset. I know a lot of the components that will make the race successful, but I've never done one. But I'm willing to go on this journey with you and I'm willing to learn. And she was mm -hmm. like, that's all I asked for. And of course, with that in my mind, I didn't immediately sign up, but I, I just started Googling and I'd run a lot when I was younger and I sort of, and, and it was just, everything happens for a reason. It's just amazing timing. And basically I finished playing rugby and, you know, am I looking for the next thing in life? No. Does it come along? We could, we could go deep on that the whole yeah. day. <laughs> but I just started looking at it and I was like, this is me. This is it. And, you know, then, then I started and I, I entered a race a couple of years later, it was 300 kilometer race and nonstop through the Omani mountains and then through this big desert for 150 K. And I was awake for about 65 hours and, and having all these crazy hallucinations and actually at about 170 kilometers, I, I pulled out of the race. I gave up mm. and it ripped my soul out. And, but I, I couldn't walk. I, I we won't go into the gory details and, and it's not justifying why I pulled out. I just wasn't strong enough. Okay. I was weak. I was mentally weak. I was physically weak. And I passed out asleep in the middle of the desert for eight hours before I was sort of rescued because these courses are long. It's a 300 K course. It's not like you can just mm. like get in a car and go home no. and a car, <laughs> a car came and picked me up. And I still have the video now. I have my GoPro and I still have the video now of this car driving us out of the desert. And at that point, I hadn't even processed anything. And I knew in my heart, I could just feel it in my, in my gut, in my heart, everywhere. This was just the start. This wasn't the end. This was just the start. And yeah, it's led to, it's led to crazy stuff, I guess. I've, I've run across the Sahara Desert. I've done... I've done a lot of sort of ultra marathons. So generally my, like, I run about 250 kilometers over about four or five days and carrying most of the time carrying my own stuff. Uh, we do a lot of challenges here in Dubai. I, I quite like the heat. So we do stuff in the middle of summer. I started in about 20. So you've got to like the heat to do these things in this weather. I mean, it, you know, yeah. the, the, the heat here is not for the faint hearted. It's, it's not. It's, it's hot. not. <laughs> It's not, and the, the good thing about, I think, extreme temperatures and, and, and these challenges is that you're always learning. Like mm -hmm. I've done, I've done a lot. And in 2020, we did a challenge here in Dubai, which was a 50K cycle, uh, then a 50K run, and then a 50K cycle through the day in sort of the end of July. And it got up to 54 degrees. Uh, yeah, and, and so it's a whole new experience. And that's what's so. amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what's amazing about these challenges. And, and I don't, I, I want to keep this quite realistic for people. Please don't compare me with you, with others, like the guys that just finished on K2, different. And I always say this, we're all climbing our own Everest. And, mm. you know, I, I don't think we should ever get down by what we hear through channels like this or what we see on social media and such and such is doing such and such. I think that's just an awful state of, 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 of the human mindset right mm -hmm. now. You know, and I work with a lot of people that, walk in at 150 kilos and, and can't run or, or can't even walk a hundred meters. Emma, and I'm just like, I'll get you there, you know? Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. you today, it's a hundred meters. So it's yes. nice to sit here and say, yeah, I ran across the Sahara. I've run through the jungle in Sri Lanka. I've done this, I've done that. But to be honest, I, it's not, it's irrelevant to, to the masses. Mm -hmm. What's important to me and to people, I think is that we wake up every single day and we get ready to get better. Yeah. And that's really the mindset that I, I want to instill. You control it, you control 
you don't control everything, but there's so many things that you do control mm. and you can make such a difference. Yeah. You and really I, I love, I love what you just said there. We are all climbing our own Everest and mm. it's so true. And I, I say often that comparison can be the thief of our own healing and growth. I agree with you totally. And not just in the envious way. I mean, in the way of comparing even comparing, oh, well, my what's happened to them is worse than what's happened to me. So I don't deserve to feel X, Y, Z. You know, it can go both yeah. ways. Yeah. And actually, it can only ever be on our own barometer, like you say, yeah. everything in life, whether it's growth, whether it's healing, whether it's pain, whether it's something bad that's happened, good that's happened. Is that you can only ever compare it to your own level of neutral right? I agree. I so agree. what you've just said there, I, I really agree with, um, yeah. because I'm not you and you're not me and we can't be yeah. each other. <laughs> it We're just all... doesn't work like that. And I think one thing that's important as well is that, you know, we, we're all so unique Mm. because of the way that we've been programmed and we've been programmed because of our subconscious we live because of our subconscious and not all of that programming is for everyone perfect in fact for no one it's perfect mate we're uh -huh. all a little bit messed up and that's cool as well I don't believe like, in normal <laughs> just so you know no, we need to be but at the, at the end of it I think what's what really when you look at human beings there's two qualities that have actually been spoken a lot about a lot in the last year, but I think we really need to sort of, people need to hone in on. And one is that we are incredibly adaptable. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we're incredibly resilient. Mm. We are able to overcome things in incredible ways. And mm. that's not, that's because we're humans. That's because of the way that we are. Some mm. people are stronger, some people are weaker. We, we get that, but we have these skills of adaptability mm -hmm. and also resilience, which right now like that to me puts us at the front of the race mm. we are so much stronger than than we actually believe that we are because of those two qualities so i think it's really important that we create some that people sort of create this clarity and this perspective around what we've got by looking in as, as you were saying it doesn't mm. matter about anyone else no. you are resilient you are adaptable as a human being and you are you and you you control you like mm -hmm. you genuinely do mm. there's I could choose, like, I've chosen to speak to you today. You've chosen to speak to me. Mm -hmm. I could have said no. You could have not even asked me to come on the show, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of people, oh, I can't say no. You can. You can. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, you know, like, but that's a result of conditioning too. Like, if you it have is. been brought up in an environment or gone through a big experience where your boundaries have been violated in some way, and I don't mean physically, yeah. it can be emotionally, then Many over ways, time yeah. you get taught and conditioned and trained yeah. that yeah. you your boundaries don't matter so yeah. you know your nervous system starts telling you that that's the safe way to be that we let people Correct. do that to stay safe right so until yeah. we learn different tools and different ways we yeah. can change we can always change if we've got the right tools and if we know how to and generally and that what, takes community it takes someone yeah, else to kind does. of step into something different right like yeah. what you've said with that woman yeah. i don't know but we'll walk it together right yeah and that's when yeah. change can happen and that's the beauty absolutely. of people yeah absolutely and I, and I think one thing as well that we don't have in abundance whilst we we've got adaptability and resilience in abundance mm -hmm. we don't have patience in abundance mm -hmm. and we need to have patience because what we're talking about here is a complete you spoke about them as tools correct mm -hmm. a complete reprogramming of our correct. subconscious correct that's what needs to happen to a lot of people yeah. and yes tools like you mentioned community is going to help Hopefully mm -hmm. listening to a show like this is going to help a certain amount of reading is going to help, mm -hmm. but it's going to take time and it's going to take hard work. And also, right. although we're adaptable and resilient, we don't all like hard work. We, in fact, <laughs> most of us are downright lazy, you know, <laughs> and, and but that's also because we don't really know what's at the core. So mm -hmm. we don't know why we're heading where we're heading. And this Correct. is, yeah, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, so many. Um, but what the one thing I do know, and I think that you echo it in everything you do, is that change most of the time, nearly 100% of the time, doesn't tend to happen as a solo person. Yeah. Um, for me, the biggest changes have always come. And it, as you say, your community can be two people, three yes. people. Yes. Yeah. But the, the key is a community where you are 
feel a sense of belonging and it's so yeah. powerful for people. Yeah, it really is. And, mm-hmm. and you know, what's great right now, and, and we've really seen this through, through the last year. And, you know, I, I, I'm using a lot of examples through the last year because I think it resonates with a lot of people right now, mm-hmm. but previously, and listen, I'm massive about seeing people in person, but if you're in a place that you feel lonely and you're unable to see people in person, which is happening in a lot of countries right now, there are so many tools out there to be well connected, Mm -hmm. whether it's on a zoom call like this Mm -hmm. or or, or whatever it is. And this is the thing is that we, we, we often look for excuses where there are so many solutions out there, you know, and, and I, I almost liken it to, I'm 42. So this might resonate with some people, but not with any, everyone. When we're at school, we had pen pals, that we used to write yes, letters to. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> you know, and I'm oh like- Oh my God, I have, I have one. <laughs> I did, I have one. I totally forgot. You know what's even more beautiful? <laughs> I have a really good friend and, and a client whose parents were pen pals and got married, which is amazing as well. That's but, amazing. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> this is all about human connection. Mm. And now we can hop on a Zoom, we can go in a group chat. I mean- I don't know, this clubhouse thing that I'm supposed to be doing, like, I don't know about that, but anyway, that's another story. But we can create these points of connection. And again, it's points of connection that we've had for years and years and years. Think back to your grandfather sitting on on the town square bench with his mates, having Mm. just a, a yarn, this human connection, this community, this support network. And sometimes, yeah, and too much actually, people are talking about the weather and COVID now, but there's this one time where it just goes bang and we're able to go deep into great conversation Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. really, and and, and a lot of that time, I I think you probably agree, Emma, a lot of that time, smaller groups are actually, we see it within our community, we're quite a big community, but we've got nice little pockets and fragments of people that are closer to each other. Mm -hmm. And I know the conversations that those guys are having on various platforms are just beautiful. They're deep. They're yes. raw, they hurt, they're, they're everything, they're, dra- they're almost drama, you know, but I just yeah. know and I get so excited as you can see <laughs> that by having these conversations, they just, and you see it over time, it's mm-hmm. so beautiful. Mm-hmm. They come on month one and they're closed and then they find this co- pocket, mm-hmm. this community, mm-hmm. and then six months later, and, and that's what I say to people, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, for, for a lot of it, our job is just to set people free. We just want them to free them from all this stuff that they're bundled mm-hmm. up and they mm-hmm. can't get out. We just mm-hmm. want to ask the right questions, do the right things to, to let them pull all mm-hmm. of this out. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think if you're ready as well, it can be, but it, it goes back again to the title. It takes a little bit of vulnerability. Oh, You've it does. got to put it all on the line. You and know? also to be truly vulnerable, I think, well, I know that there is an, a huge element of feeling safe that is required and that's where you know I see this sort of phrase find your tribe banded about so loosely but actually that's a really (laughs) good it's a really good (laughs) phrase if you take it to a deeper level because if you really really take that to a, a deeper level finding your tribe is really finding people that really resonate with you, that really get you, not just in the broad sense. So yeah, yeah. for a particular experience, for whatever it is that you're holding in that you feel too ashamed, too scared to talk about, yeah. if you go and find that, like you say, the the smaller pockets yeah. where they're all in there going, yeah, I get it, I get it. Yeah, what that yeah. does is that creates a whole little pocket of people that go, oh, I feel safe enough to say my, say my yeah. stuff now because yeah. no one's going to judge me and all, all these people are going to still think I'm great. Yeah, just despite yeah. this and then that's a when real of, vulnerability just comes pouring out because they're safe and they can yeah and i i agree with you but i also think a lot of it is is maybe we talked about programming the subconscious in in, in earlier life mm-hmm. i think in the last few years our subconscious has been impacted and programmed in, in a funny way that we walk into a room and to be honest i used to do this as a kid i used to walk into a classroom and i was very shy like, why is everyone looking at me? I looked a bit different. I was, I was bleached blonde hair because I lived in Dubai when I was a kid and I was in boarding school in the UK. So I I rock up, I've got this white mop of hair and this dark skin, you know, and, 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 and and people are looking at me like, and I'm like, why is everyone looking at me? And then I realized that actually no one's looking at me and no one cares. 
you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, that's weird because we create this image that whether it's, whether we're hiding behind brands, behind clothes, what we're doing to ourselves, how we're making ourselves look and a oh, whole other show, but never mind, mm -hmm. we'll move on. <laughs> we're sort of almost hiding. And it's like, we're raw, we're humans. Yes. We're naked. We came naked. And, you know, there's, there's a phrase in the Bible, naked, I came from my mother's womb, naked, I will return. The mm -hmm. Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, you know, and it's like, we came with nothing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need to, we need to revisit that because, mm -hmm. and, and once we do, once we, I, I want you all to shower daily. I want you all to wear clothes that are not totally ripped and all of this stuff. I don't want us all to be, for <laughs> want of a better word, tramps. But I want us to stop living in this. I love it. He's like, please nonstop. don't stop showering. <laughs> yeah, well, it's quite, you know, because sometimes I say stuff and it gets a little bit taken out of context. Like, Marcus, you, you, you told us not to care. And I'm like, yeah, but mate, you stink. Like, chill. You know, <laughs> like, there's certain things we've got to keep. But once we see past all of these defense mechanisms that mm. we put up, then we can jump into these groups and we can just go, bang, this is yeah. me. Yeah, and it is you for want of a better term you just start to feel reborn yes yeah. you just you're just like holy shit I had so much I was keeping inside mm -hmm. and I was struggling so much and suddenly because you said it I feel a little bit comfortable if you go along I drop this I drop everything and I'm yeah. just me I'm raw and I'm a human being and I'm an incredible human being mm -hmm. and I'm here to get better Mm -hmm. life starts to change mate and that is you know playing into vulnerability like that's mm -hmm. the it's actually quite funny i i used to get accused a lot of 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 like not being in touch or lacking vulnerability and I, it, it annoyed me for a bit and then i was like are you kidding me i stand on the start line of these races i ran around a 400 meter athletics track for 24 hours mm -hmm. i told the media that i was going to run 30 marathons in 30 days I'm as vulnerable as you can be. Yeah. And in the last, in the, and, and you can edit this out if you want, but in the last four hours, when I was running around Sports City track, I had to go into the toilet. I was shitting myself, showering with the, with the mm. butt hose, coming out, farting on everyone. Like, it's gross, but mm. that's about as vulnerable as it can be. And, and I think people really need to dig into that and just drop, drop a lot. And then they'll really start to to flourish and to live and, and just to feel, like I said, they'll feel absolutely reborn, mate. Mm. And I just want to talk a little bit more about 2018 because not only did you do the 30 over 30, but it was after something quite yeah. big <laughs> uh, that happened early, to, to you earlier in the year, right? So you mm. were training for the ultra cycling yeah correct and tell me what happened so this is so guys just to put this into some sort of context because if this guy hasn't blown your mind already he's about to blow it again <laughs> so he did the 30 30 marathons in 30 days in november 18 which is when i you know found arrived and in, in marcus's kind of sphere of knowing him <laughs> like knowing about him and in february 18 you were training yeah. for another you know, mental um, task, physical task. Yeah. And, and what happened to you? So I was, yeah, my, my goal at that time was actually to set a world record in cycling. And I was two weeks out from the first race and I was in the mountains, halfway between Charger and, and the East Coast, Calba. And I was hit by a truck, which I then hit a wall at 54 kilometers an hour. I took the impact on my left side, so on my left shoulder, and incredibly, I didn't hit my head, <laughs> which is just like, it's, 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 it's crazy. The whole story is crazy. And, and I laid on the floor, and I do what I think a natural reaction sort of that I had from rugby, like, can you feel your fingers? Can you feel your toes? And mm -hmm. I did that check, and I was like, oh, I can. That's not too bad. So my spine's okay. And then I realized... It's funny because that was my first check. And then I realized I can't breathe. And I'd later find out what had happened was my, my shoulder was broken. My scapula was broken. I've broken seven of my ribs, which that's not really, that doesn't threaten your life. Broken bones don't threaten your life. But what did threaten my life was the fact that my left lung had 
for want of a better description, had almost like a beach ball that had just gone push, and then yeah. it comes really, the, the air goes out and it comes really tight. So Oof. breathing was incredibly hard, mate. And Oof. it took, because of where I was geographically, it took about three hours to get to. I was going to say, you must have been room. so far from anywhere. Yeah, I was. But, oh. and I think that's what, you see, I see it. That was, please, don't get me wrong. I would have loved to have been around the corner from the emergency room. <laughs> like, I'm sure. I would have absolutely loved it. Yeah. But I think what makes it, what makes it quite an interesting journey is, is that sort of two to three hours that it took to get to the emergency room at, at Calba. And, you know, I, I went in two different ambulances. None of them had any painkillers. Oh. First one didn't even have any oxygen in it. And, oh my gosh. you know, I was just in this, in, and, and I, you just can't breathe, you know? And I'm literally, and, you know, I, I had quite an interesting moment on, on the side of the road, which, which is a long-winded story. There's a, there's a whole documentary about it. I want to try and keep it short because it's, it's, yeah. it's easier to action for people. But I sort of just had this moment on the side of the road and... I was like, wow, what, what do I do? And I was like, well, there's no choice here because, and, and, you know, in reflection, and I've had three years now to reflect on it, you know, I, I wanted to live more than I wanted to die. And with that thought, I was like, well, what, what should I do? And that's where the, the, the thought process of fight for every breath came from. And I just mm -hmm. said it, just fight for every breath. And, you know, we, we're in a world right now, there's, there's so many different choices and we've got decision fatigue and stuff. And that just has, has helped me so much because I was like, well, there is only one choice. And actually, mm. most of the time in life, there is only one choice. We just make it super complicated because we, we're trying to make a decision. We go into Google, we ask 300 people. No wonder mm. we're confused. We're completely mm. confused, you know? And, and I spent the next sort of three hours on the way to the hospital fighting for, for my life, fighting for, mm. for breath, and then three days in ICU. And that was horrible. It's, uh, again, I, I, I learned so much along the way. I see you quite funny because it's almost like a holding cell, sort of like, are you going to the graveyard or are we going to let you out to the main ward? And, oh and no gosh. one really knows which way you're going to go because they're, you're basically in there and just, again, with time to see if you get better. You know, and no one can tell you, yeah, mate, you're going to be absolutely fine and it's going to be cool because they just don't know. And, you know, they come every few hours to check that my lungs working a bit better. And luckily it was, and I, I was, I was progressing. So after three days, they, they stuck me in the main ward for, for another five days. And it was actually, and I think this is quite an important link here. It was actually in the main ward where after I think it was, yeah, I'd been in, in, in this bed for like four or five days and I finally sat up and I thought to myself, hmm, I'm in a little bit of a tricky situation here. Um, what about that cycling? And I was like, yeah, I think, I think we probably have to shelve that. And uh, I was like, nah, that's not, that's not sitting well with me. And, and I sort of thought, well, if I can't ride my bike, I can, I can definitely run. And I just flicked back in my phone. I, our sort of community when it comes to these events is quite, it's quite messed up. We kind of just send each other like stupid challenges, you know, like <laughs> from time to time. And I just remembered a few weeks ago that a guy had sent me this, this route and it was in Corsica and it was the length of Corsica. And I sent it to a good friend of mine. I was like, mate, this is it. We're going to run this in July. So we're, we're literally talking five months. And he replied back. He said, mate, you've not moved from a hospital bed for five days. Let's talk when you get out. Let's talk when you're out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that, like, fired me up a lot and and sort of, yeah, it really, really got me moving. And, and there was just these beautiful checkpoints along the way until eventually later that year in, in, in November. I, I well, in, on the 25th of October, I think it was, when I, when I started the marathons and, you know, I, I, I learned an incredible amount during that time and, and I'm still learning now. So thank you so much for asking that question because every time I talk about it, I learn something and it's, it's therapy for me because I'm able to get it out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I kind of want to wrap that up maybe with that in that I remember one day in the hospital, I, I, I was incredibly fortunate. So many people came to see me and give me their energy and their time, which I think time is one of the most amazing things we can give to each other. And, yeah. The guy came in and he was a local guy and he said, keep talking. And I was like, what? 
and everyone would come in the hospital and I'd, I'd go, hey, Emma, how are you? You know, like, because I was mm. chronic and, mm. and, and they'd all be like, no, no, don't say anything. And I'd be like, no, I, I want to talk. I want to talk, you know, and, and he mm. came to me and he came quite close to me and, and, and he said, just keep talking about it. He said, my brother's had a lot of accidents like this. He said, God knows how he isn't dead, but he's never spoken about them. And now he's suffering an incredible amount mentally. So I was sat in that hospital room for about five days with streams and streams of visitors. And it, it was incredible, mate. And I just got to tell the story over and over and over. And since I've probably done about a hundred or so interviews like this and got mm. to tell it. And so that trauma that I went through no longer sits inside in my, in my heart, in my mind, it's mm -hmm. out there and yeah. it doesn't make it any easier. I, I was getting interviewed the other day and I completely broke down and that's oh. happened three or four times. And, yeah. you know, and the last thing about that story, which this if you're a little bit superstitious or freaked out by superstition or whatever, this will blow your mind. My accident was on February the 10th, 2018. Go to my Instagram, February the 9th, 2018, MJD underscore Smith, and see what I posted. There's a picture of me and a really good friend of mine and a quote that I wrote on that picture, everything happens for a reason. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know and so whenever I when and I'm ha I have moments mate it's not always easy it's sometimes quite tough and in a, in very various areas of life not just the recovery from my mm -hmm. crash physically and mentally but when it's getting tough I always think about that I'm like how did you write that and you posted that on the 9th and then mm -hmm. on the 10th mm -hmm. you nearly lost your life you've got mm -hmm. it you, you wrote it because you believed it mm -hmm. And you've got to live it. So if people are struggling, and I often say this, just just roll with it. Things are happening for a reason, mm -hmm. and you need to just stay focused and 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 just stay with it. And you'll get through it. Goes back to what I said. We're incredibly resilient. Mm -hmm. We're very adaptable, mm -hmm. and we we're, we're strong. So I'm just. Um, firstly, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that because that's okay. Well, you know, it, it's not a nice thing to go through, right? It's um, yeah. it's a lot for a human being to go through, and yeah. that being so far away from um, from a hospital and yeah. learning as I talked to you that you had an ambulance but guess what there was no oxygen and no takers I mean you may as well have just been in a car and when an ambulance comes you expect to have oxygen pain relief right yeah. as a basic yeah. as a basic so to yeah. learn that that wasn't even yeah something you got and then you've yeah. got this three hour journey with your thoughts I mean that's yeah. that's that's an intense period of time for a human being to kind of navigate their way through but it was funny <laughs> mate funny things happen along the way mm because we went into the first ambulance and it was like a it was a it was a police ambulance under repair we got told and they tried to turn on the the oxygen so there was an oxygen tap and they tried to turn it on but it hadn't been used forever so oh. this rusty water dribbled out and i was in there with one of the guys <clears> who was <throat> riding with me and i kind of looked at his face and i know that he wanted to laugh and I kind of just looked at him and laughed. Like I, I, I was in this pain, but I was just like, oh my God. And, and, and then he came into the second ambulance with me and it was quite a bumpy road. And they were trying to put a, what do you call it? A cannula into cannula, my, yeah, into, yeah in, into my hand. And he's petrified of needles. So he's basically the nurse or the paramedic is getting him to help. And he has to watch this cannula go into my hand. And I'm looking up at his face and he's just turned sheet white. Oh gosh, it's <laughs> all you need is both of you down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But inside I'm, I'm, I'm almost laughing because oh. I'm like, he must hate needles. And we laugh <laughs> about it till this day. So, you know, in, in every situation there's, it doesn't make the pain go away. No. But, you know, you, you can either choose to, to sit there and go, this is painful. This is getting worse. This is getting mm. worse. Or, or you can just look for those, 
I don't know if you'd call them glimmers of hope or, you know, just <sighs> stuff that makes you, makes you smile. And, and we hear that a lot, you know, if you, if you can't, if you can't smile, if you can't laugh, mm. then you're in a pretty tough place or, mm -hmm. or go back to what we were saying about community, mm -hmm. find, find a community that's got a comedian in it because, mm -hmm. you know, it'll mm -hmm. really, it'll really help you. Mm. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with me and sharing your thoughts as well. Um, while you were in that space and, and mm. hearing you talk about ICU like that, I've never heard someone talk about it like that, but <laughs> the way that you've described it is it makes sense. And it's yeah. <laughs> what a, I've never, you know, and you just never thought about something in that way. Yeah. Um, but now you say it, y yes, like it is yeah. a bit like that and very strange space to be in. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I think, and I think that's what we're saying. Like sometimes you have to, you have to pull apart all the all the stuff that's in front of stuff and just mm -hmm. go like what is this room mm -hmm. like you know and 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 just mm -hmm. be cool with it as well mate you know and i've got my family sat there and it's going beep and bop and you know it was hilarious when they 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 eventually moved me from one icu to another icu and i kept on setting off all the alarms because my resting pulse is so low my resting pulse is like 35 and when it drops below 40, all the alarms go off. And I was just, it's hilarious, this place. And I'm like, like, can you stop this? And they're like, well, not really, because the guy next door is probably going to die in the next 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know? And, oh, and my gosh. I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange thing, death, Emma. And I'm not, you know, it's, I've always had quite a strange relationship with it. For, for a number of reasons, which is probably now not the time to talk about it, but you know, I've, I've always just been quite relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about death, but we'll try and make it a bit more, less negative than death, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, there's these situations where if you just look at them a little bit different, you just strip everything away. What really is it? You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I see you was like, mm -hmm. you're either going to make it in the main ward or, or you're going out in a box. And, you know, you, you have to, you almost have to come to terms with that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us are stuck in this sort of state of denial. And I say it a lot in, 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 in my talks that, that I give, I talk about having an ultra mindset. And one of the first things is, you and it's hard. It's so hard. So if anyone's thinking, yeah, this is easy, it makes sense. No, it's not, it's hard. The first thing is, is we have to, if there's a problem, we have to admit there's a problem. Yeah, for sure. Like people are sat in denial. No, I'm not suffering. No, oh yeah. I'm, I'm happy in this relationship. No, you're not. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know you're not. I can see you're not. You've never said anything nice about your partner. You're yeah. not happy in that relationship. No, no, I am. You're in denial. Mm -hmm. And it's super tough. Mm -hmm. Like, but if we're going to live incredible lives and, and, and not just, I think sometimes when we say we're going to live our best life and, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to live incredible, people think we have to be climbing Mount Everest and stuff. No, if you're going to live happy and content life, yeah. we have to admit when we have problems. And that is, I mean, it's so beautiful how it plays into the title of your show because mm -hmm. that's vulnerability. Like it is, that yeah. really at the crux of it it's like if there's something going on there's there's something going on and and it's weird how society has changed that when people speak up speak their 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 almost their mind mate as long as they're not being offensive but you know sometimes like, oh wow that's a bit out of character not out of character but like you know that people don't normally say that out you of know? social and, norm <laughs> yeah you got it sorry I've, I've sort of lost the words there thanks for the help that's not the socially normal thing to say <laughs> Yeah, it's like, well, it's okay, you know, mm. it's like, I need a piss, like, that's okay to say that if you need to go <laughs> to the bathroom, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And you know, sometimes, I'm like, oh, you can't say that, it's like, ah, you know, stay cool, we, we have to, we have to keep things, I, I think, and, and for those who have listened to the show, thank you very much, and, you know, but the, what goes through is we have to keep things quite raw and quite simple, if mm. because we're complicated enough and there's enough complications mm. if we want to live ultimately happy we need to we, we don't have time to to be complicated and and we don't want to make decisions around complications so we need to keep life as simple as we can and, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful if you do it mm -hmm. really is mm -hmm. like you just you, there's so much happiness out there and you know and you don't have to be a full minimalist guys don't worry more 
two t-shirts is good like three is probably too many <laughs> but one's not enough <laughs> no, but i mean some people are so and you look at minimalism though i mean that's a whole other subject isn't it but you look mm. at stuff like that now and how people are just really going back to basics and i think there's a there's a lot in that and there's mm. a lot but it's hard to get to it so mm. yeah Marcus, thank you for sharing oh. everything and your thoughts and just, you know, unpicking life with me in this conversation. <laughs> I really appreciate cool. No, I really appreciated it. Um, and go on to Marcus's bio. Your handle, what's your Instagram handle? MJD underscore Smith. So go to his Instagram, go on his link in bio. In there, there's a link where you can actually watch the documentary about that accident yeah. that he had. Um, there's bags of information. There's a podcast that he hosts. Um, go check out this guy. He's got bundles of good stuff that will enrich you. your life. So go oh, follow him. Kind. Go Thank fill you. up your cup. Be motivated. Be inspired. Because um, I'm definitely super inspired by you and and... What, you, you know the little that I the little that I see and you know you're doing good stuff so thank you so much and straight back at you mate as I said before we started I, I listened to a few mm. episodes of the show and you're doing really good stuff speaking to really interesting people so we need more straightforward real talk so keep it going thank you thank you very much <laughs>